So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 54, and I'm really excited to welcome on Matt Cooper, who is currently the CEO of Skillshare. So most of you are probably familiar with Skillshare, which is an online learning platform that has over 13,000 teachers on its platform and is used by over 15 million students. So Matt also has some really incredible experience when it comes to marketplaces. As prior to Skillshare, he was an early executive at Upwork, then went on to become the CEO of Visually, which was a managed marketplace for freelance creatives that was eventually acquired. So Matt, welcome to the uh, group chat, and it's definitely uh, great to have you join us here today. I'd like to do a deep dive into Skillshare as a marketplace during the uh, group chat today. But before we do, maybe you can start off by sharing a little bit more on your background for those that don't know you, then uh, more on your marketplace experience prior to joining Skillshare. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, started my career in investment banking uh, after four years of uh, telecom media technology banking. I was quite ready to go do something else. So uh, moved out to the Bay Area in 2002 and um, just through basic, you know, being an unemployed telecom banker in Silicon Valley in 2002 uh, was not exactly the greatest uh, position to be in. Uh, met a guy on Craigslist, believe it or not, um, and we started advising some companies. Uh, and then I ended up sort of doing that for about a year and then joining one of our customers full time. And uh, that was kind of my first true startup experience, which was a company that they basically outsourced the internal recruiting function uh, for small and mid-sized companies. And that was kind of my first inkling on the enterprise side of just that flexible workforce model and the idea that you don't necessarily have to have all the talent you need inside your four walls as full-time employees to get the job done. Um, we had a great run from 2003 to 2008, mortgage crisis hit, um, all of a sudden, Selling recruiting services to venture-backed companies in the Bay Area was not uh, not a great place to be. Um, and thankfully, I stumbled across um, Odesk, which became Upwork. Uh, they were looking for their first sort of full-time head of operations. So I, I joined to run customer service and trust and safety. And when I think I was employee number 23 at the time. Um, so just had a magical five-year run uh, at Odesk Upwork, um, started out running operations, but ended up, uh, built out the enterprise business. Uh, it was about a hundred million dollar top line business when I left, um, ran international, ran BD. Uh, so I sort of referred to myself as the executive storm drain, whatever didn't fall neatly within one of the other teams I ended up with, which was just a ton of fun. I got to cover a lot of ground. Um, left there uh, it, to join, to be the CEO of Visually. Um, and Visually was a similar freelancer driven model, more of a managed marketplace approach where we had a, a group of freelancers on the back end that we would package up on the fly to deliver all kinds of visual content. So static infographics, interactive web modules, you know, long form video, kind of really any, any kind of visual creative they needed. Um, we would, assemble these teams on the fly to deliver that for brands uh, and agencies. Um, that was a bit of a turnaround situation, which is uh, being kind, um, but we, uh, we got it turned around. Uh, we ended up selling it to a, a company out of Toronto in 2016. I stayed through the integration and then uh, came across Skillshare uh, in fall of 2016. Uh, originally joined as the CEO, COO, and then took on the CEO role about a year later. And, and when I, you know, when I came across Skillshare, it felt like I was walking back into Odesk in 2009. Uh, it just had about the same size. I think we were about 35 employees, had all of the same, you know, two-sided marketplace challenges and benefits, uh, kind of a similar level of maturity. Um, and so, you know, I just, so when I saw the opportunity, it kind of had everything I was looking for. I mean, one, just love the two-sided marketplace business model. Two, it was at a stage in maturity where I felt like it had, I could have a lot of impact. Um, and three, just the, the social benefit and the social impact and kind of the clear mission-driven culture that they had. That was something I had at, at Odesk. I would go present at these international conferences that were um, sort of more freelancer focused. And 
I mean, I was a rock star. I was the ODES guy. I would sign autographs. I'd have people follow me around. Like it was, it was crazy. Um, and, you know, to see just firsthand the impact that ODESK had on our users. I had people coming up to me with tears in their eyes, like wanting me to take a picture with their kid who they could now send to private school or handing me the keys to their car. Like so one guy drove five hours through the night to crash an event in India so he could show me the keys to the car he bought with his ODESK earnings. And he was the only one in his village who owned a car. Um, you know, so those types of stories, I've seen the same thing at Vision, or excuse me, at Skillshare, where, um, you know, just the creative expression, the exploration, the personal journey, and particularly during COVID, we just had a lot of teachers who, you know, day jobs dried up, and now all of a sudden, you know, having their Skillshare side income, pretty damn handy to have around. So, um, you know, having that social impact and that social mission was really important to me. So, um, you know, Skillshare now, I've been here for four and a half years. Um, we're pushing 145 employees now. Um, revenues have grown uh, almost 12x, 13x, I think, since I joined. Um, so we've just, you know, we better be lucky than good. I think we got a great business model and uh, we've had some nice tailwinds over the last 12 months, um, but really, really proud of the team we've built and, and uh, a lot of the marketplace challenges that we have overcome uh, over the last four years. That's awesome. That's uh, quite the journey. So thanks for uh, sharing more with us on that. Yeah, I definitely want to jump into some of those challenges. Um, but before we do, uh, you know, I have to ask, uh, you know, what's your, what draws you to marketplaces? What's, what's your interest in marketplaces? Um, I just think, you know, as a core business model, the the internal inertia that the business model has once you reach a certain level of scale is really hard to beat. Uh, I think they're extraordinarily difficult to start. Um, and I think people underestimate how hard it is to get that two-sided buying and selling and liquidity going. Um, the idea that you're just gonna build it, people show up and start transacting, like just doesn't happen. you know. So uh, Gary Swart, the Odesk CEO, um, you know, we talked a lot about the chicken and egg problems and, you know, his favorite phrase was you got to fake the chicken for a while. Um, and I think people don't realize just how long you have to fake the chicken uh, before things start to evolve on their own. And, you know, I, at Odesk, like before I started, you would call in and Gary Swart, the CEO, would answer the phone, qualify you, take a $100 credit card deposit, and then say, okay, great, let our algorithm run its magic, hang up. And then somebody would jump on Skype and start banging out invitations to engineers all over the world, trying to find somebody to fill that job. Um, so there was a long period of faking the chicken. Um, similarly at Skillshare, on the teacher side, like our 2014, 15, 16, were us manually dragging teachers onto the platform and begging them to teach. Um, and, you know, we didn't really worry that much about quality control. We worried about volume. Like you just had to get something for people to respond and react to. And that dynamic has shifted over time. But, um, you know, it's three years of faking the chicken before things just really started to take off. Um, and I think people don't quite realize how much effort it takes to get it going. But again, now that we've got scale, I get 200 teachers in a thousand classes every month without lifting a finger. Um, so if you were willing to put in all the blood, sweat, and tears in the early days, what you get on the back end, um, that's that magic of the, of the marketplace model. That's awesome. That's uh, very well said. And I think also comforting for some of us too that are in the early stages, knowing that it is uh, manual yeah. and us picking up the phone yeah. too on the other end, right? Yeah, get, get comfortable because it's yeah. going to be a while. Yeah, yeah for, for, for a long time. Well, that's great. So uh, if we're to jump into Skillshare a little bit, um, you know, if we're to break it down as a marketplace, um, could you kind of uh, explain it further for those that might not be as familiar with it? Yeah, so you know, at the core is the platform um, and it connects the supply and the demand, the buying and the selling. On the supply side, you have our teachers. It is an open platform. Anyone can come in and teach as long as they follow our guidelines, meet our standards, et cetera. Um, every class that gets uploaded, we manually review, we score it against a rubric. If it meets the minimum score, 
it stays on the platform. If not, it comes down. We send it back to the teacher with feedback. Um, and, you know, again, we are now at a point where we're getting, you know, roughly 200 teachers um, and a thousand new classes every month. Um, we also uh, sort of in sort of a, a deliberate continuation of faking the chicken, um, we produce our own classes, which we call Skillshare Originals. Um, we only produce four to six a month, given the, you know, relative to the thousand that we have coming into the community. So it's a pretty small number, but it's been interesting to see how we can use that that little lever to guide the rest of the community where we want it to go. So whatever style, the content, the focus, you know, the transitions, the music, like anything we're doing in our Skillshare originals, we're setting a really high bar for the rest of the community. And it's interesting to see how they will follow the design and style cues that we're giving them, you know, based on here's what we think is high quality. Teachers will, the best teachers will work very hard to mimic that style and that quality level. Um, and also we can seed uh, the market. So there are certain creative subcategories where maybe we don't have a lot of depth. Um, you know, interior design is a great example. We, we brought, uh, we did a Skillshare original with Emily Henderson from HGTV. She has a massive social following. She's a brand name. She teaches her class on Skillshare. She brings students with her. Other teachers want to follow her. It's a signal to the market that, hey, there's interest in interior design. Other teachers start to pile in and teach interior design and poof, we have an interior design subcategory. So it's been an interesting way for us to continue to fake that chicken along the way and gently nudge the supply side of the equation where we want it to go. Um, on the demand side, we have our students. Um, we're an interesting model and in we're an open platform, two-sided marketplace, but also with a subscription model. Um, so just to just to add a little complexity to the business, um, so the students they pay now I think it's equivalent of fourteen dollars a month if you pay annually in advance, uh, or thirty dollars a month pay as you go uh, for access to all thirty three thirty four thousand classes that we have on the platform. Um, now marrying that marketplace with the subscription, the way we pay our teachers is we take. 30% of our revenue in that month, we divide that across the teachers based on their share of the minutes watched. Um, so you're a great teacher, you've got a hit class, you get 5% of the minutes, you get 5% of that royalty pool uh, for that month. So, you know, for us, what we've seen is students who watch more minutes, they retain longer, they're clearly getting more value, they're happier, NPS scores go up, all that. So we've aligned how our teachers get paid with the closest metric to that we can find to are, are, are these students happy and satisfied and, and likely to retain. So um, I think we've, you know, it took, so, took a while to get to that model, uh, but I think it's a, it's a really healthy one. And then obviously the job of the platform in the middle, how do we get the right content in front of the right user at the right time? Um, but we're also looking at different ways to engage. So. Uh, we've been running live live sessions. We have workshops, which is sort of a string of classes and projects around a particular topic. Um, we tested some audio content, so we're you know we're testing other ways to get students engaged. There's also a heavy community component to the platform. Um, part of our core pedagogy is you need to you got to actually put this thing to work. It's not edutainment. It's like going to the gym. If you just go to the gym and sit on the machine, nothing's going to happen, right? You actually have to exercise and you have to move your move your mind a little bit. So we want people to take the class, complete the project. Every class is required to have a class project. You complete the project, you upload it, you get feedback from the teacher, you get feedback from other students. Um, and that community interaction is really important. Again, drive more value, drive more uh, retention. Um, so that's something that you know we've we've truly really tried to emphasize that community component as another differentiator above and beyond the content. So that's that's kind of the high level picture of the business model. That's a uh, really excellent uh, breakdown. So thanks thanks for that. I know it's going to prompt quite a few questions here in the uh, Q and I'm sure. Um, which is uh, you also mentioned something was uh, pretty interesting, which was the uh, the originals for the uh, courses that you're creating. Is that kind of like a uh, you know do you use that as kind of like a like a measure or a benchmark for for other content to be created? Is 
Yeah, and, you know, I think what's interesting is if you look at our highest paid teachers, it's not the originals teachers. It's our, you know, our our top teacher who came up through the community, he makes hundred thousand dollars a month. So he'll he'll easily break a million dollars this year on Skillshare. Um, so we, you know, I think the the originals classes, you know, again, it's sort of our style, it's our production, it's our approach. Um, we try to emphasize the things that we want other people to copy. But what's interesting is the best teachers sort of take that and then up us one. Um, and that's, you know, that's where the that power of the crowd and that power of the open platform um, comes comes to bear. Because if we, you know, when I think about business models, if we were to be purely a production model and not have the open, uh, the open platform, like there's just no way Skillshare as an editorial team could sit in a room and come up with what's going to be hot and interesting. Um, we've got 13,000 teachers trying to figure out what's going to be hot and interesting. I'm going to bet on them. Um, you know, so I think we, in many cases, the originals are actually in reaction to the content that we see bubbling up through the community. So a couple of years ago, Procreate, which is a, a, a hot iPad illustration app, uh, that was sort of like, we'd never heard of it. And we started seeing teachers talking about it. We started to see classes pop up. We started to see the minutes watch to like, hey, there's clearly something here. We would never have seen this coming. But then we call a broker and say, hey, you want to do a Skillshare original with us, right? So it's an interesting sort of back and forth dynamic between the two. In many cases, we're teaching the community something about how we want it done. But very often, the community is telling us where we need to go and where we need to emphasize. That's, a, that's really interesting. Um, so uh, on another note, kind of off that, uh, you know, as far as the categories, um, you know, did you like early on, what categories did you offer? And then I believe you're focused more on creative now, right? And then how did that kind of yeah. evolve maybe? Yeah, that, that was an interesting evolution. We, we were doing a little bit of everything um, up until 2019. And we sort of organically evolved to have expertise in creative. And when I started, I was actually pushing us to do more in business and tech. You know, there are other platforms out there that are more horizontal, do a little bit of everything that are a la carte. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's another just sort of important business model differentiator. A la carte content versus subscription content. There's a reason why iTunes at $1.29 per song is dead and Spotify is a public company and you have Apple Music and Google Play, right? That subs we've just been conditioned to consume content via subscription. So a la carte content businesses, it's just a shitty business, right? So um, if you could put the two of us side by side, if we can reach content parity and we can get the same depth in business and tech, why would you ever pay somebody else 10, 20, $30 a class when you can subscribe to us and get all of them? What we underestimated, it's really hard to get content parity. Um, you know, because we had evolved over time to be really strong in these creative verticals. So when you think about these marketplaces, you know, it's not, you're not one monolithic marketplace, you're a bunch of vertical marketplaces that happen to be stuck together. And so when we, because of our strength in creative, when we launched into business, anything that was adjacent to creative did really well. Marketing, anything sort of design thinking, design strategy, brand strategy, that stuff did well because there were plenty of creatives who wanted to bleed over into that skill, front end tech skills. Um, CSS, you know, it's just a good thing for a designer to know. Um, if we try to jump too far into finance and accounting or data science, there's crickets chirping. Teachers weren't making any money. Nobody was watching the content. There wasn't a lot of content to watch. Everybody's pissed. So if we had people coming in and looking to learn data science, we had enough to convert them. We didn't have enough to retain them. Uh, and they left annoyed. Um, and so in 2019, you know, we had our sort of mid-year offsite and we just said, let's call it, you know, let, let's take yes for an answer. And where we're getting a yes is in creative. And we went back and we did all the research on how big is the market. There are 5 billion people in the world who have a creative profession or a creative hobby. You look at Adobe, Shutterstock, Etsy, like there's just, there are lots of public companies focused on the creative market. 
you know, Adobe's market is a, is 30 to 40% of our addressable market, right? So if they can build Adobe on that market, we damn sure can build a big global public company on it. So, you know, we just was, as we got focused on that, you know, and then you always have the angst of like, well, but, but, but what about data science? It's like, it, it just, you know, yeah, you can, it doesn't mean you should. So it was hard to walk away from, you know, and this is sort of classic startup conundrum. Do you walk away from what could be to focus on what, focus on what is and what you're really excellent at? And um, it's just amazing how much tighter the business, the product, the content, the messaging, everything got once we focused in on that creative vertical. And now, sure, there are other, mar- there are plenty of marketplaces out there, content, you know, learning platforms that are bigger than we are. There's not a single one that can go to toe to toe with us on creative. We'll beat them every single time. So, you know, it's sort of the the fox versus the hedgehog strategy. Like we went hedgehog, and I think it has definitely paid off. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sounds like, and that's uh, great to hear about the uh, story of kind of the focus. Um, so, so you did mention uh, metrics. So, you know, what is kind of like the north star metric that you're, um, you know, optimizing for, and then maybe some of the sub metrics if you could share some. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that has that number has been a moving target. Um, Right now, we are focused on gross sales. Uh, and you know, we and the way we look at that, so there's there are annual plans where we get all the money up front. There's monthly plans where you get it as you go. You know, on an annual plan subscriber, they're higher retention, they're higher value. Like we want to get as many annuals as we can. Monthly is sort of a necessary evil. Um, so transaction value, monthly net sales, monthly transaction value captures that. We don't necessarily get to re- recognize all that revenue, um, but then you know we were historically we were tracking paid members. Um, problem is not all. We now you know we've now changed our our pricing in international markets. An Indian user is worth a fraction of a German user, um, so not all users are equal. And um, you know you get valued in the market based on your your sales and your revenue, not your subscribers. And yes, of course, they want to see subscriber growth, but ultimately um, driving higher value sales, higher LTV plans. Uh, So we've really zoned in on that top line net sales transaction value number as our our God metric. And then we are tracking things like number of paid subs, paid growth, emerging market growth versus uh, higher wage growth, et cetera. So we've got lots of submetrics, but top line monthly sales is, is number one. Awesome. And then, uh, you know, how, how are you reaching more the, uh, more users on the, as far as on the subscription side of people that want to learn about, you know, different, some of the creative courses that you offer? Yeah, uh, we do a lot of influencer marketing. Um, so if you, if you spend any meaningful amount of time on YouTube, you're going to see a Skillshare uh, spot. Um, we do, you know, a lot of the typical digital marketing um, we get a lot through a lot of referrals and affiliate traffic. Um, you know, our teachers, we, we pay them sort of an affiliate type fee for referring new students. We have a student referral program. So um, those are meaningful components. One of the areas that we've, you know, because we were so good at influencer marketing, um, we just have not invested a ton into our SEO and organic that's been a gr- much larger focus over the last six months. Um, and so we've started to see our organic traffic really pick up as a meaningful source. And, you know, we got 33,000 classes making the, in- the transcripts searchable, translating those transcripts into, you know, the major languages. Like there's just a ton of opportunity for us uh, to continue to expand that content footprint that we haven't yet taken advantage of. So that's all of that's underway. Awesome. Yeah. Sounds like it's uh, quite, quite the opportunity. Um, so, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I did have a, you know, a question for you as, as far as, you know, say I'm someone that, you know, I subscribe and I come in and I take one course, um, you know, what are some ways that, you know, I, that are maybe uh, prompting me to then, you know, explore more courses and, and take mm-hmm. more courses? Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of the kind of the typical recommendation engine, which is, Actually, another really key area of investment for us is just continuing to optimize that that decision of you know what how do we get the right content for the right user at the right time, right? So, 
based on what channel did you come in from? Um, what, you know, what did you immediately click on? We've just revamped our onboarding so you can start to you know, give us more clear signals of what you actually want to get out of this. Are you coming in to poke around as a consumer because you like watercolor or are you coming in because you need to learn how to do, you know, 3D effects in this particular um, illustration design software? Uh, you know, so we can get, there's sort of the implicit signals. If you're coming in through a photography focused acquisition channel, great, let's get photography content in front of you. But if you come in and you, you know, sometimes it's, I don't know if you watch Seinfeld, but there's the episode where he was pretending like he was movie phone. And, you know, he was like, why don't you just tell me what movie you'd like to see? Um, and you know, it's sort of the same effect. Like, you can spend a lot of try time trying to guess and infer what people want, but if you just ask them in a very clear, concise, simple way, they will tell you. And then you can start to react to that. Um, so it's, you know, I think we're trying to find the right balance there. We want to at least have some context of what they're looking for before they ever, before they ever tell us. But let's also just give them the opportunity. Just what are, what do you want so we can give it to you? Uh, I think doing that in a very simple way obviously adds a ton of value. I think companies tend to get a little cute with it and kind of the onboarding wizards and all of that. And you just, some of it's too much, but getting that clear signal right away certainly helps. That's, that's a re really interesting. Um, so on, on another note, as far as the community, so you, you mentioned that uh, earlier in the chat, you know, so um, how are you thinking about kind of building community around some of your students and then maybe even some of the, uh, some of the teachers? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's sort of a couple of flavors. There's the student to student, student to teacher and teacher to teacher. Um, you know, on the student to student, a lot of that today happens through projects and groups. So we have, a, you know, again, all the projects, when you upload it, you'll get feedback, you'll get likes, you'll get comments from other students on your project. So that's sort of within the confines of a class. Um, the other, we, we have, so discussion groups around certain topics. Um, so it's sort of Skillshare moderated and hosted, but you can jump in and talk about photography or design or illustration or cooking or interior design, whatever it might be. Um, and then, you know, the, the other things that are kind of evolving, uh, the community components, the workshops, where you're taking a series of classes and completing a series of projects with a cohort of other students. There's a start date, there's an end date, you're going through it together. There are weekly deliverables. So it feels a little more structured and a little more like you're in a classroom with other students uh, learning these things. So there's a couple different angles there. That's an area where we see a huge opportunity and we're gonna invest a lot more in the coming uh, year or two. Um, the student to teacher, again, most of that interaction is coming through the class and through the projects. Uh, I, you know, I teach a finance and accounting class, which shockingly does not get a lot of minutes. Um, but uh, the, I, you know, I got a question today about, hey, you know, after you take out revenue and cost of goods sold, like, what are you left with and where does it go? It's like, I jumped in, I answered, you know, so we can have some back and forth on that, that particular question. Um, the, you know, as we're looking at other engagement models, things like workshops, things like one-to-one -one coaching, like some of our teachers, there's sort of a cult of personality around our best teachers. I mean, these prints right here, are from Aaron Draplin, who is one of our most popular and one of our more entertaining teachers. Like we could put up a class of that guy brushing his teeth and people would watch it. He's just funny, he's entertaining. Everybody loves Aaron Draplin. Yeah, so people wanna be close to Aaron Draplin. Um, and so giving him other ways to connect with his students and, and other ways to monetize his expertise and his knowledge, uh, that's something that we're, that we're looking closely at. Um, on the teacher to teacher side, uh, we sort of have it tiered out. Um, we have what we call our top teachers group, um, and that is our, our top 100, 120 teachers uh, who they produce a lot of classes, they produce a lot of minutes, they get a lot of engagement. We have a, a private Slack chat. We have two employees who support that group. They're there to answer questions, give suggestions. We do thought starters. I'll give sort of an annual state of the state. Uh, we'll do a, 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 a two, three day teacher program for those top teachers. Um, and then we have a sort of another group for more of the developing up and coming teachers where we're trying to help people 
sort of break into the Skillshare community, high, you know, higher, higher potential, but less experience on the platform. And we've got a couple different mechanisms to help them get their first class out. <clears throat> and then we have kind of a, a broader outreach program. Anybody can come in and take, take our teach challenge. And we kind of walk you through the steps and more of an open webinar type of format to help you get your first class out and, and, and find success quickly on the platform. So we've kind of got a couple different tiers based on uh, your interaction. And just, you know, I can jump into the teacher Slack and just for me to be able to sit there and watch the interaction, what are they talking about? What do they care about? What are they not like? Uh, it's just a, it's a great source of information for us on how to improve the platform. Yeah, yeah, that definitely uh, sounds like it. Um, so I, I have to ask, you know, have you seen uh, students become teachers and kind of, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, complete the loop? Yeah, and that's one of the kind of one of the other interesting flywheel effects. One third of our top 100 teachers started as students. So one of the things like over time, we've been very careful to make sure that demand is growing faster than supply so that teacher earnings continue to rise over time. Because as teacher earnings rise, it gets easier to convince new teachers to teach. It gets easier to convince your best teachers to teach again. It gets easier to attract the big names for Skillshare Originals, which means you have more content, you have better content from bigger names, which means the value of that subscription goes up, which drives more engagement, which drives more retention, which drives more growth, which drives more earnings. And you can see how that flywheel starts to spin. So that having, and as that student pool grows, we have a never ending supply of new teachers coming into the platform. So that's been, you know, again, on that faking the chicken, we spent three years faking the chicken. Now we've actually gotten much more aggressive on our quality standards. And at one point, a couple of years ago, we actually deleted 16,000 classes off of the platform. Um, so you can see how that has flipped from us dragging people in to now us consistently raising the bar to make sure that the quality is super high and the teachers are delivering the content that you would expect of a platform that you know, cost $167 a year. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, re that's really interesting. And that's uh, quite the incredible flywheel. So um, just, it might be helpful for us to kind of understand, you know, at what point did that kind of flywheel kind of kick in, right? Like we always hear about this in the term and whatnot. So, uh, you know, where some of the students were becoming teachers, like at what point mm -hmm. in time was that? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the student to teacher conversion, I think has been pretty consistent. But again, I think as our, you know, our teacher earnings have probably tripled over, over the time I've been here. Um, so I think the, actually more than that, because given our growth, so I mean, our total payouts, um, you know, have grown along evenly with revenues. So, um, you know, as the, as the, you know, the value of teaching on Skillshare has grown, we've just seen more students interested in, in making that switch. And, and we see it all the time because you may come in to learn, you know, radial symmetry on Procreate, but you happen to be a Lightroom expert. Um, and so once you kind of see it, it's like, hey, I can do this. Um, and we've actually, that was one of the ways in the early days that we were attracting teachers. We would see students who are producing really high quality projects in other classes and say, hey, like, why don't you come teach? Like, you're really good. Why don't you, you know, what's your take on this? What's your spin? what's your method or approach or style, why don't you come teach that? And we would kind of help them get that first class on. So it's something that we, you know, again, we gently fake the chicken early and then now it's just, just sort of taken off on its own. That's, uh, that's really cool to, uh, to hear about. So, and uh, I, I'm assuming too, if they start as students and, you know, then become my teachers, then they have really good understanding of the platform from both sides and can uh, help ensure sure. a better experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, cool. I feel like uh, I just realized uh, we're kind of uh, running a little bit behind on uh, on the group questions. So we'll jump into those so you and I don't just chat the whole time. That yeah. sounds good to you. Um, hey, uh, Rich, did uh, do you want to jump on? Yeah. Hey, Matt. Uh, Rich here from Bamboo. We're a marketplace that connects wholesale food suppliers to restaurants in cities, giving them on-demand supplies, less inventory risk and less food waste. Um, we're gearing up for our first funding round and, you know, you probably haven't done a funding round for a while at the very early stages. Uh, do you have any tips for that kind of first check or two, um, for marketplaces? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the, the frequency of use is always an important metric early on. 
right? You want to show that that it, you're not a you're not an a la carte business posing as a subscription or you know a, a single transaction business posing as a marketplace. Um, I think for yeah, there are different types of marketplaces with different frequencies. For something, you know, for selling cars, you know, um, you know, Carvana's trend, you know, I, you only show up every now and then to buy a car. You know, it's only several years. So I think in your type of business, like how many, you know, what's the frequency of use? How many users are in there? Whether it's, and I don't know what the right frequency metric is. Is it every day? Is it every week? Is it every month? But sort of understanding what is that ideal frequency that shows you've set the hook and how many users are above that threshold. Because um, I think you're trying to show that, no, no, this is a, it is a marketplace. They are coming in, they are using it. They're using it in the way that it's intended. Um, and even if it's a very small group, just showing, hey, we've got a very small core group, but now we know who they are. We know why they're different from the ones who don't engage every day. We know exactly who to go get we know what they want out of the platform, like really understanding every single nook and cranny of those core users who are doing exactly what you want them to do. Um, like saying, and then we're gonna take your pile of money and we're gonna go find a bunch more like that. And we're gonna go build all these things to either make those users easier to acquire or higher value, or we've got all these other people on the fringes that we can bring into that fold if we add this functionality or we think about it this way. So I think coming back to that, who's that ideal customer and what do they look like and what are the behavioral patterns and how do you repeat that? I think that seems to be a, a consistent theme in those early conversations. That's great, thank you very much. Awesome, yeah, that's a really great uh, question and uh, answer on that too. Um, and, and by the way, I'm sorry you have to go raise money, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, deterring I, the story at least. Yeah, uh, it's been, by the way, it just, it never ends. So we raised our series D last summer and, you know, it just, it never really stops, so. Awesome. Hey, uh, Jake, uh, did you want to jump on? Yeah, sure thing. First off, Matt, thanks for, uh, for giving your time. A lot of really great nuggets of wisdom in there. Uh, I had a question uh, specifically around uh, one of your previous companies visually, you mentioned that it was a bit of a turnaround story, you wanted to see, um, you know, really what was up with that and what was the, you know, what turned visually around? Yeah, um, I mean, I think there were, there were some people side issues uh, that, that we had to address. Um, but I think the sort of the core business model issue was we were kind of stuck in the middle. And, and this is actually, and, and to be clear, I did not make the right decision here. Um, I was way too slow in deciding. Like, are we a are we a freelancer driven creative agency, or are we a marketplace? And we were kind of stuck in the middle, and we never really made a clear differentiation. And so, like, we had we had. You know, it's sort of the, well, I can't give you the full service that you want for a creative agency, but I'm a lot cheaper. <laughs> you know, so it's like, I'm going to give you a subpar experience, but it's so affordable. You know, so that was like, it was a weird pitch and it was kind of hard to, and so like we were starting to, we were building more tooling to move us toward kind of the full, like hands-off marketplace approach and kind of the the vision I had that we were just way too slow to get to was you come in and you enter a brief. And pool number one of freelancers just crystal, helps you crystallize your brief, right? They look like customer service reps or consultants, but they're just freelancers and they get paid X amount per brief. They come in, they help you clean up your brief, make it crystal clear what you're looking for, what you want to get out of it, great. And then out of that, you need two designers, one engineer and a voiceover actor. All right, great, spin the giant wheel and we produce, here are the three that you can pick from, right? Pick one, two, three, great, here's your ad hoc team, off you go. Um, and then there's a project management tool and a project manager assigned to that. 
and they're walking and they're making sure everybody's hit their dot and head deadlines and you know like we were kind of like we sort of had that layout and we kind of talked about it that way but there was no product behind it like we were doing it manually um and we were just kind of stuck in the middle and it, you know had we just said we're a full service agency but we're just a hell of a lot more affordable because of how we staff our deals that would have been fine too it's not a venture backed business it's not a product driven business but it could have been a very successful profitable business um so i think i and i it's funny in my first startup which was a recruiting startup we had the people side but we also offered the technology the margins of a service business don't actually have generate and are they rarely generate enough money to fund the r d for a product-based business right so you end up with this weird disconnect of you've got the r d costs of a software business but you don't have the gross margins um and so it's it gets really hard to find the capital to invest in making the longer term, highly scalable, highly efficient product features that you need because you're trying to keep yourself afloat with the service business. So that we were stuck in the middle there. I think we got to a workable and survivable solution that got us sold, but we never really, we were still stuck in the middle when we left, when, when we exited. Thank you for that. That's super helpful. Yeah, that's going to be uh, super helpful for a lot of uh, others in the group when we share the recording. I know uh, there are a lot in uh, similar, um, I, I would say, positions where they're running agencies and looking to kind of yeah. make the uh, transition into marketplaces. Yeah, and quite common right now. Yeah, and another sort of anecdote there. I mean, one of the turning points, which was before my time at Odesk, was you know they were sort of running this manual staffing process behind the scenes. Finally, they said, look, we're going to put up a profile for every engineer. We're going to let the customers post their own jobs and we're going to burn the boats. Like we're getting out of the middle. We are not going to help you. You are on your own. And, and they went the other extreme where, and that when I joined, they had been at the other extreme where if you needed to talk to someone, you just couldn't. There was nowhere to go. There was no one to talk to. You were on your own. It was wild, wild west. Um, and so they were trying to figure out what did the customer service function look like and sort of dial it back to a more reasonable medium. Um, and that's when I came in. But it took them just saying, we're out. We're not going to touch anybody. And if I were to go back to visually, I should have done that a lot sooner. I should have stripped it down to the flying gas can, one product manager and four engineers and use the money we had to rebuild a self-service true marketplace product around Greatest. It's uh, super helpful. You have a great way of uh, articulating your experience, by the way. So, uh, nice. um, cool. So, I actually had a question for you myself. Uh, I know Rich wants to jump back on here in a second, um, which is, uh, you know, how, like as far as, well, first off, I guess, what's the team size like at uh, Skillshare? And then, how do you kind of uh, build a culture and kind of the focus, you know, since there are so many different kind of opportunities and you're in a creative industry? Yeah. Uh, so we're about 145 employees now. Um, since COVID, we've gone completely remote. Uh, so we, our office expired in New York in December. We're going to be remote first. Uh, we'll offer the team access to um, co-working space uh, if, it, if they can't work for, or don't want to work from home for some reason. And then we'll do a couple big company-wide get-togethers a couple times a year. Um, so we're, we're, we're not going to save any money. Um, we're just going to redeploy all that, you know, that hundred thousand dollars in monthly New York City rent uh, to uh, to hopefully better and more useful things. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of just you know building the culture and the team, uh, you know, I think we we try to distinguish between values and culture. Uh, the cultures change over time. Like the culture today is very different than it was four years ago when I joined. That's normal. Every time you add a new person, the culture changes a little bit. You can't help that. Um, but the values shouldn't change. And, you know, our, our core values, transparency, impact, community, curiosity, we hire for those values, we promote based on those values, we give reviews based on the value, those values, we fire based on those values. Um, and so it's okay for the culture to shift and change. And like, you know, it was when COVID started, 70% of our team was in New York, 
30% was distributed. I think 10 to 15 was international. Um, now we're probably more like, yeah, we're probably 50 to 60% outside of New York. We've got a much larger international team. Um, you know, cultures change and, and they should change. Like the culture of a startup is different than the culture of a Fortune 500 company. So, um, you know, but having those values to always come back to and hold people accountable to those values and make sure that we're living those day to day, that's ultimately, I think, what, what needs to be constant over time. Awesome. And then, uh, you know, out of, out of curiosity, you know, uh, what keeps you up at night as a CEO? Oh, man. Um, you know, it's funny. Like, I, I would actually say not a lot keeps me awake at night. And, and it's not because we don't have fires burning. Everyone does. Um, you know, this is a marathon. And I just, maybe it's just because I've, I've been around long enough now that, you know, every day there's a new fire popping up. And generally speaking, it's just not that bad. You get through it, you'll figure it out. Um, the other reason I don't stay up late at night worrying about a lot of things is that we've got an unbelievable team. Um, and this was something I learned from Gary Swart uh, at ODESK, the CEO at ODESK. Um, if you get really good people in the room, life gets a hell of a lot easier for the CEO. Um, and I'm not, you know, the whole, I, I've, you know, I've said this in a couple other speeches and presentations, like the whole idea of it's lonely at the top, I just think is bullshit. Like if it's lonely at the top, you didn't hire well, or you're not leveraging the people around you. I've got a board, I've got advisors, I've got my exec team, I've got their direct reports, I've got people I've worked with at other jobs, like there's always someone to talk to and bounce an idea off of and get feedback. And if you're stuck on something, there's just a long list of people willing to help. Um, so I just, you know, I try not to spend too much time, you know, worrying on worrying about things you can't control and try to keep the team uh, focused on the things that you can. That's uh, that's great. And that's uh, comforting to hear versus uh, you saying everything keeps you up. So <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I've, I've got, I've got four daughters. That That's what keeps me up at night. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, uh, Rich, did you uh, want to jump back on? Yeah, for sure. It's uh, around that question around the hacking the supply. Um, mm -hmm. And basically right now we're in a pivotal moment where we can continue hacking supply. And for context, that means going to wholesalers and like shopping inside their stores. But mm -hmm. from a cost point of view, it's not particularly scalable. It's very operational. And it means we're investing all our technology in that direction versus just saying, let's cut that. And let's actually partner with the suppliers. They do the work for us. We go and pick up the deliveries for them. So at what point do you think you should actually make the switch and be like, right, enough of the, the scrappiness. Let's actually focus on building those relationships and focusing the technology around that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's easy for me to say not, not being the one responsible for it, like cut over as soon as you can. Um, but I think my guess is there are probably certain, either certain products or certain distributors where you now have enough volume in that particular thing where you can cut that one over, right? So if you kind of think of this gradual migration of when do you have enough liquidity in that one thing that you actually can automate it, goes directly to the supplier and let the automation be in the middle instead of you being in the middle. And then just gradually over time, you're, you're constantly faking the chicken until you don't have to anymore. You start to learn when that threshold is and then you hand it off. And then you focus on the new skew or the new thing. How do you get that thing to the liquidity? Then you hand it off. And like, you're just constantly migrating things over until eventually you get to the point that you don't have a lot to do on that side. Um, you know, I think one thing to be cautious of is, you know, whoever's in that manual job, it's hard to convince people to say, hey, I want you to work yourself out of a job. You know, and that will be uncomfortable for people who are in those operational roles that like your job isn't to keep doing this. Your job is to stop doing it. So how do you make that happen as soon as possible so that you get to manage the machine instead of be the machine? Um, that, that can be tricky. Yeah. And I think just as an anecdote, what's keeping me up at night is Instacart's been faking the chicken for almost a decade now. And they still haven't made that transition just yet until now. So I'm like, how long do I need to fake the chicken for? Is it the well, next and, years yeah. or is it? 
Yeah, and you know, look, there's nothing wrong with a little hamster wear. Um, as far as the customer is concerned, it's all driven by AI. You know, like, and then you just got people running around shopping stores, trying or you know, grocery stores, trying to pull stuff together. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, to your point, like, I, you know, Airbnb is sort of famous for the do things that don't scale mantra, yeah. and there's just a lot of people who do that. It, it does work for a long time, and. And by the way, like, you know, one of the interesting enterprise projects when I was at Odesk, uh, Google, uh, Google Knowledge Graph was a customer. Uh, and so when you type in, you, know, you search Kevin Bacon and you get that structured box of content on the right-hand side, it's Kevin Bacon, it's his picture, it's his name, it's the last four movies he's in, you know, all that, any kind of that structured data, a lot of that is coming out of Google Knowledge Graph. Well, they had freelancers working, they had 15, 1,600 freelancers working 24 seven on Odesk, structuring the data that the algorithm couldn't handle. Mm -hmm. So Google is faking the chicken, you know? So it just, some of that, I think if anything, people are scared of doing that forever and they try to automate too early. Um, so you know, again, if the economics work, who cares, you know? So I, you know, I think the, there's a time and a place for manual intervention. Um, and if it's affordable and economically sustainable over a long time, you know, sure it might be even better if you can automate it, but it might mean you can put your resources somewhere else in the meantime. Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah, that, was, that was great. Um, so we're uh, almost out of time here for, uh, for the questions. Um, I actually did have a question for you, Matt, though. And that was, uh, I know you mentioned uh, that you're working with some earlier stage marketplaces and even doing some, uh, some, some uh, early investments. So what are maybe some um, common characteristics and maybe the founders or the marketplace kind of businesses that have attracted you to them? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, a lot of it's just the pattern recognition of what I've seen at Odesk and, and Skillshare uh, that worked. Uh, and, and, and what didn't work, you know, visually, um, you know, I think the, uh, you know, vertically focused, I, I mean, I just, I learned a huge lesson about vertical focus here at Skillshare. Uh, and so finding those niche marketplaces that, you know, on a, you know, when you take that niche and you expand it on a global basis can get really, really big. Again, the whole beauty of the internet is that global aggregation of demand that you just can't get in a physical environment. That's where you know some of these vertically focused marketplaces can really pay off. Um, so I think that's one. Um, and I, you know, I think about the companies that I'm advising or have invested in. You know, all of them have a different spin on. You know, one was sort of freelancer marketplace focused on high end consultants. Another was freelancer and, and hiring marketplace focused on women and technology. Uh, another is a Skillshare type model focused on gaming. Um, you know, so they're just, I think that's a, as I sort of think through it, those are the fairly obvious threads uh, that have been consistent for me. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. It's uh, actually, uh, yeah, the, the one for gaming, um, the founders in, in the uh, community also. Yeah. So that's a, right. that's a really cool one. As an example, yeah. yeah, it's. I mean, and it was sort of right up my alley. Like I've, I've seen all that before. I've yeah. seen it applied to a vertical model. Like it's a, it's a good business model. Yeah, awesome. Well, cool. So we are almost out of time here, but uh, last question that I have for you, I'd like to wrap it up, asking, you know, what's one memorable uh, story or kind of moment throughout your journey with marketplaces? Oh man, uh, there's a ton. Um, yeah, I, I think probably one of the more entertaining one uh, is on the fraud, uh, trust and safety side. Uh, not long after I started at, uh, at Odesk, uh, this guy, Ron Aquino, who was running uh, trust and safety, he's now, uh, he's, he's gone on to do some pretty amazing things on the trust and safety side. Um, he said, yeah, well, we got a call from a guy looking for his motorcycle. Uh, and somebody had created a fake website and was selling custom motorcycles over the internet and they said, look, when we take your credit, we take your deposit, you're gonna see a charge from Odesk for $10,000. That's just our deposit. We use Odesk for our payment processing, so don't worry about it. Um, well, you know, a couple months go by, you know, the cycle, uh, the cycle folks have gone dark uh, and he calls us saying, where the hell's my motorcycle? Uh, and we turned out 
a freelancer was paying at his buddy 10 grand on Odesk uh, as a fixed price uh, project uh, to cover the cost of this fake motorcycle that they never built. So um, there's a whole nother rabbit hole on trust and safety and fraud and security and um, you know all the unbelievable things people do to screw you out of a little money. Um, but uh, that's uh, that's probably a, a better topic for another day. But that was that was one I had not seen before, and thankfully have not seen since. That's what a wild story. So uh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, well, this is a, re a really incredible chat. So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks again for uh, you know taking the time to uh, join us and share more about your experience and uh, insights, which is uh, incredible. Um, but last but not least, um, so time for kind of quick plug. Where can we uh, keep up with you? Uh, so. Skillshare.com, uh, Matt underscore Cooper on Twitter. Uh, and then uh, you can, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. So I uh, really appreciate you having me. A lot of fun. Uh, this is definitely great. So I uh, re really appreciate it. So thanks great. everyone for uh, joining in for the uh, great questions also.